Welcome to Voices in the Village, a dialogue special coverage of the Liang Hui or two sessions. Let's take a second look at Premier Li Keqiang's government work report and examine the Chinese defense budget for 2019. China is aiming to complete its national defense modernization by 2035 and transform the PLA into a world-class military. All modern methods are being used to support and strengthen real combat capabilities and efficiency. But some on the outside view this with suspicion, as China's military spending has become the second largest in the world. So how does China view its security environment and non-traditional security in the foreseeable future? What are the highlights for modernization this year? And what does a smaller increase in this year's defense budget mean for the country, the military and the world? To discuss these issues and more, I'm very happy to be joined in the studio by Xi Hui, commander of the International College of Defense Studies at Piaolin National Defense University, and Yang Xiyu, senior fellow of the China Institute of International Studies. We will also speak to Russian defense analyst Pavel Fagohar in Moscow on telephone. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. <laughs> Welcome to our discussion here. First of all, Mr. Xu, what is the standard <coughs> for modernization of the Chinese military by the year 2035? Mm -hmm. you know, military modernization uh, is one of the four modernizations you know, ex uh, proposed by our former Premier Zhou Enlai in last uh, century's 1970s. And given the reality today, the other three, more or less, we almost realized the goal, but the military still lag behind. For instance, from the level of weaponry and equipment, we still have a large number of, you know, the two, genera two genera generation two, you know, uh, of the uh, weapon system. So it's a far lag behind by the modernized weapons, you know, by the had by, by the, you know, advanced troops. So we should not keep this gap forever because we have learned the lessons in the past. If the gap is too big, if we have a generational gaps, gaps in terms of weapon equipment, that will lead to, you know, terrible, you know, situations as it was in the 19th century. So we have to follow the level, general trends of military, you know, uh, equipment and the weaponries. And in addition to that, the mindset and the quality of human resources also should meet the needs of today's, you know, weaponry and technologies, you know, development. Hardware is mm. basically not a big problem for the PLA. It mm -hmm. is a, perhaps a mm. military theories mm -hmm. uh, and a national security strategy. Mm. That should match the military build-up in terms yeah. of hardware. What yeah. do you make of this uh, uh, kind of a capability by the Chinese uh, military to upgrade its own theories so that we could somehow coordinate our armed forces uh, in this regard with uh, those in developed countries? Well, uh, yes, you're right. Uh, actually, uh, mm. the capability or the quality of the military forces in the world in general combined by hardware and the software and uh, to PLA situation you're right uh, the software modernization uh, will be harder than the modernization of hardware although we are not at world class in terms of hardware uh, yet uh, the software the gap from the software is bigger than hardware so the software means uh, as you uh, mentioned uh, build up a modern uh, Military, uh, military series strategies and uh, meanwhile uh, human re uh, world class human resources uh, human resources say our commanders our soldiers should be the world class with the world class weaponry systems so basically it's a long way for PLA to build up such a Modernization, modernization combined by the hardware and the software. Uh, needless to say, for the modernization, uh, not only a lot of human resources input, but also money input. Yeah. 
Pavel, excuse me, oh, uh, Pavel, um, uh, war games and joint military maneuvers have taken place uh, each year between the two militaries, uh, Russian and Chinese alike, uh, and therefore it is an opportunity for Russian observers to to come up with a comparison and to have uh, more uh, knowledge on the level of the Chinese military modernization. I'd like to have your thoughts. Uh, well, the Russian military uh, 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 commentators and the Russian professional military know that the Chinese are getting really better. It's a totally different armed force than it was uh, a couple of decades ago. It's a full transformation from the uh, peasant army of the times of the 70s or 60s into a modern force, and uh, they're actually somewhat envied the uh, capabilities and the new uh, uh, hardware that the Chinese military have. So there's a lot of respect for the Chinese military here, and unless there is a most likely worldwide and there's some away because uh, this is, of course, a uh, uh, China and Russian military have been facing each other as potential enemies for quite a long time during the Cold War. Now it's, of course, very different, but there are st the Chinese buildup is seen as, well, uh, maybe good uh, in general as Russia and China are partners right now, close partners, but still there is a positive, there is some kind of, well, second thoughts what this may mean in the future. China is transforming itself from a continental power to one that combines a continental and a maritime power at this moment. Look at the uh, build-up of the Chinese Navy, and by the, by the way, this year witnesses the anniversary of the Chinese Navy. So what do you think of our capability to project our armed forces uh, uh, with uh, uh, with, with so many uh, gunboats and uh, rapid construction of aircraft carriers? Well, yes, of course, this is very important right now and seen as Russia is important, though uh, traditionally um, the Russian military were mostly thinking about the Chinese army and uh, the, the Russians and the Chinese are facing each other during the Cold War at the, ch at the border where Russia was expecting a terrible battle could happen. The Chinese Navy is seen in Russia right now as more of a threat, a potential threat to the United States. Uh, right now, Russian and Chinese naval interests do not really uh, get into any conflict, uh, conflict at all. And, uh, yes, the Chinese build-up is important, of, and the Chinese planning to build aircraft carriers is also very important, though, of course, they have not yet really a op fully operational uh, aircraft carrier yet. Russia itself is thinking about maybe having aircraft carriers, but there, in terms of maybe at the best one or two, uh, the Russian military don't have right now the financial resources of the ch their Chinese colleagues and uh, are still thinking in ter old terms of being mostly underwater or smaller ships, not really building big ones. As Thank you so Chinese much, Pavel. Right Thanks now. a lot. But we'll get back to you in a, a couple threat, of minutes. Really. We'll get back to you in a couple of minutes, uh, but uh, Mr. Xu, uh, Pavel obviously uh, presented <coughs> his views with a mixed feeling about uh, how to look at China. Mm -hmm. The implications of China's military build-up, which he says in the future, might be something questionable for uh, the national security of Russia. I, I don't know why the, these guys in Russia have a, a strong sense of uncertainty, but uh, that concerns us uh, for at least one issue. How do we assess these strategic uh, security environment uh, over the past four decades? and? Uh, looking to the future, mm -hmm. uh, what do you think of the uh, major threats that we consider very serious to our economic and construction and modernization? Okay, uh, generally speaking, you know, okay. since the opening up and reform up to now, even, you know, in recent years with the dramatic change of international, you know, security situation, we still maintain the position uh, that peace and development are the main theme 
of the time and the aspiration of the people in the world. Although none of them has been perfect, but we never changed it yet. Yes, there are a lot of risks. You know, as a terrorism, you know, new type of you know threats, hybrid threats, and uh, the three evils, as we said. So, so a lot of kind of threats is rising now. We also face, but for Chinese foreign policy and defense policy, we have never since opening up. We have never take any specific country as our enemy. Yeah, we only take or regard these kind of threatening forces or the activities as a threat. So our approach is to, you know, try to cooperate with all the countries to deal, you know, to address the security challenges. See, so um, do you think after the United States uh, under the leadership of Donald Trump uh, has taken China as the uh, public enemy number one or the most devastating strategic threat to the national security of the United States? Uh, in so many uh, official documents mm -hmm. uh, of the Trump presidency, um, do you think South China Sea is uh, likely to be the most dangerous flashpoint for the two militaries? Well, uh, uh, I look this issue in another way. Uh, there's uh, another potential issue um, more dangerous than the uh, differences uh, on South China Sea between U.S. and China. That is the Taiwan issue. Mm -hmm. uh, strategically, China will not be modernized, will not be, uh, will not be able to bring about a Chinese dream without the unification. But the reality is the obstacles uh, blocking the unification uh, maintains a very dangerous factor, that is the potential military conflicts, inter especially intervened by the outside uh, power, say the United States. So internally in Taiwan, there are some the force for independence, but the externally, the, uh, uh, the United States, some of the political forces really support or like to see the separation uh, between the, uh, across the street. So PLA has to be ready for the worst scenario based on the best preparation. Mm -hmm. So I think if the worst scenario uh, comes true, then uh, there will be military conflicts, uh, certainly, uh, between PLA and the U.S. on Taiwan. But on the South China Sea issue, I think uh, uh, there are two category contradictions. One, one category is the contradiction between Chinese, uh, China and uh, the other claimant countries. They are the major parties on this issue. So U.S. as an external power, I don't think they have a stand or ground, legal ground, to intervene, but the U.S. Uh, if U.S. intervene by force, of course, PLA will certainly uh, make a, a, a required reaction. But uh, in possible future, I don't think uh, uh, China, U.S. Uh, differences between China and U.S. on freedom of passages will trigger a military conflict. The United States is not a party to unclose. Neither is it a complainant. Uh, claiming the country uh, in the South China Sea. However, it vows to protect freedom of navigation and overflight. Uh, we're discussing China's military build-up and what it means uh, for the future of the world peace and security with uh, Mr. Xu Hui from the PLA National Defense University and Mr. Yang Xiyu, our regular commentator of current affairs. Stay with us. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. What do you make of the modest decrease in our national defense spending uh, by 7.5% compared with 8.1% in 2018 and after double digit growth for five consecutive years from 2011 to 2015? Mr. Xu, the defense budget's increase have slowed to a single digit since 2016. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a good trend, it's a good development. You know, since all we know, the military power by Earth is a uh, power of destruction rather than, you know, development. So to some extent, to my understanding, the lesser you spend on that, the better it will be. But how much, you know, uh, military budget you should have, it depends on several factors. For instance, your general perception on the international and national security environment and uh, your 
economic capability to support the military budget, and also your defense policy. You know, so for, uh, for China, I think uh, from these three perspectives, the growth rate this year is appropriate. We are not necessarily to all the way seeking for a high level of growth or not. It only depends on these three, you know, factors. I think. Uh, this has a lot, of, of course, with uh, economic mm -hmm. slowdown this year. Mm -hmm. uh, the GDP growth rate of China is put to uh, is put mm -hmm. at six point uh, right. five and six mm -hmm. percent this year. Um, having said this, uh, since the early 1990s, the PLA has not fought a single battle. Uh, I'm talking about the border clash between mm -hmm. China and Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So, what does the, the intensive military training mean? for the mm. combat capabilities of the PLA or the armed forces of China, Xi Yu? I think the uh, intensive training is the must. Uh, it's the must for modernization. Uh, so we have seen uh, the more and more intensive trainings in recent years under Xi Jinping's leadership. Uh, and meanwhile, I, uh, we have seen uh, the fast growing of uh, quantity and the quality of Chinese military weaponries. So uh, mainly uh, during the past few years, I think uh, PLA uh, in the fast track of modernization mm -hmm. on, uh, on both sides, uh, say uh, weaponry, uh, weaponry uh, modernization and uh, <coughs> training modernization. Uh, Mr. Xu, what do you make of the importance of training? Mm -hmm. We have a saying that uh, the most rich you spend, you know, in training back training ground, the less blood you have, you have to sacrifice, you know, in the battlefield or in operations. So training is a very important way for every military to make their troops highly readiness to deal with every possible, you know, threat. For China, as you said, this is an army that haven't have engaged in large scale company for almost three plus decades. It's a very annual period in Chinese history. We cherish peace, but the more you expect for peace, the more readiness the troops should be. Especially given the time we have enjoyed too much longer, too, too long time for peace. So the military should be always remember your missions to protect the country. And the more, the, the better you, you prepare yourself, the less the possibility you engage in another bloody war. But what makes a, a difference between the mm. present day level of a combat readiness and uh, what we had in the early 1950s when we had the Korean War and later on mm -hmm. uh, somehow uh, the involvement with the Vietnam War is and will be perhaps the one child policy. Uh, this has been talked about for a long time. Let me get back to Pavel. Pavel, uh, since the Dockham crisis, Indian scholars and the media have been talking about the combat capability of the PLA uh, since the end of the Korean War. What do you think of the current level of combat capability of the PLA? Well, yes, of course, it did fight for quite a long time, but um, actually no one in the world has been really fighting peer-on-peer -peer so-called conflicts. These being more, more kind of... Uh, 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 conflicts between uh, seriously uh, more modern forces and uh, uh, alternative forces in Afghanistan and other places in the Middle East. And that experience sometimes is not actually very good if you move to a peer-to-peer -peer, um, situation between uh, really modern forces um, I and mean, serious forces taking each other. The experience of fighting uh, non-conventional mm, uh, kind of guerrilla style operations is not a good experience. Sometimes it just simply is better not to have any than to have that. So no one's really right now ready, but right now other, any, everyone is trying to become ready because the possibility of confrontation between uh, real big, big military powers has increased, I'm afraid, in the world. And uh, people are trying, and militaries are trying to be on par. Uh, big exercises organized in Russia and in the, in the West. Um, actually, um, real maneuvers, I mean, uh, with uh, different sides playing against each other. How it Pavel, works out, if it ever comes to a fight, that's another issue. Pavel, um, you know, 
Russian troops were sent in to Syria for combating uh, terrorists at the same time the training uh, was able to be transformed into real combat capability. Um, but coming back to the Beijing studio, uh, Mr. Xu, China is drafting a law on the welfare of military veterans and may submit it to the top legislature for deliberation in the second half of 2019. Mm -hmm. Last March, mm -hmm. China set up the Ministry of Veterans Affairs as part of a sweeping institutional restructuring of the armed forces. To what extent will this change the way veteran rights will be protected in, in China? This remains a major concern for those in the service and for those who have retired from the armed services. Yeah, I, it's a very important you know, policy we take, you know, especially in creating such a kind of government agency. It's both for good for, for it's good for both retired military officers and men, and also for those still in active services. Uh, you know, we have a large number of troops. We also have an even larger number of you know veterans. You know, so they need to be take care. And in the past, we don't have specific organization like that. And the reasons for setting up such a kind of organization, I think, is go parallel with the reform, because we, uh, the retirement system also is going to be changed. So those veterans need to be ha need to have a good take care, and it's a very good encouragement for those still in active service. Well, what yeah. do you think of this uh, discussion about the orders for the armed forces uh, and their? Of course, their loyalty for the country and the national interest uh, should not be questioned. But the loyalty must be based on widespread respect of the society for the armed forces. But yep. it seems this has been a, a vulnerability, not mm -hmm. something we should be proud of if you review the history of the Chinese military build-up, mm -hmm. um, particularly our treatment of the POWs. That remains in the, a popular topic for uh, debates on the social media. Uh, what do you think of uh, the, this uh, political will of President Xi Jinping to uh, make a PLA or armed forces a, a highly respected profession? I think uh, that's a both for a political situation and a national uh, security situation. For political situation, every country in the world, not only in China, every country in the world, the national spirit should certainly be uh, should certainly include the spirit of respecting the veterans. That's a part of the national spirit, and I think now uh, we are build up such a spirit. Uh, to uh, we are filling up uh, this uh, item into our national spirit, and uh, for security reason, for security consideration, without respecting the veterans, uh, then. There, will, there won't be respect of the military forces that is current uh, here for our national security, for our people's life. So only when the veterans uh, enjoy the, so, uh, the all societies' respect, then the military forces can enjoy a solid base, uh, both politically and uh, socially, so that they can uh, play a more important role, more effective role to guarantee the national security. The last question is very much about the alleged weaponization of the outer space. The United States has uh, decided to create a space force to counter what it claims is China's and Russia's militarization of the space. What do you think of their major <coughs> move in the outer space? Do you think mm. it's wrong or it, uh, the United States has the legitimate reason to be afraid of China's uh, um, so-called militarization of the outer space? Yeah, they coined the term of militarization and put it on China and Russia. Uh, but uh, if we review the history of the development uh, of space technologies, America always takes the lead. And in terms of the military militarization of the space, I think America now is very is one of the very few countries that have a special branch of space force. You know, and uh, China doesn't have that. And China's policy is quite clear. And we not only call it with the U.S. and also the international community, we should work together to develop rules uh, in space technology development and try our best to make the space technology for the purpose of peace rather than for fighting. Xi, very quickly, before we conclude this discussion about China's military build-up, mm. uh, 
are you confident that the two militaries, the United States and China, will be able to have peaceful coexistence uh, following the rules and the regulations about the uh, weaponization of the outer space? Uh, I'm confident, uh, say, peaceful coexistence between the two military powers. I'm confident uh, simply because of two reasons. One reason is the interest is huge, it's very attractive for cooperation. That is why Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping pointed out uh, win-win cooperation remain the only best choice for U.S. and China, including the military areas. And uh, the other reason I'm confident is the cost, the result, if the confrontational scenario occurred between the two military forces. So because of the attractive uh, positive factor and the uh, destructive negative factors, the two military forces, regardless of your ideologies and the beliefs, you have to cooperate and coexist in peaceful. But in terms of the outer space, I'm afraid, uh, leading, led by the United States, the beautiful space will be militarized. I I have been joking. Now we have uh, uh, we have seen Pentagon say five angle uh, building, but w in future we will see the six angle uh, uh, building in the defense defense department because they they are building up the new uh, forces. So that will lead the e that will push the outer space into a militarized zone. Thank you so much. When we look at what the future might hold for the outer space, we need to keep in mind the Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI, during the Reagan administration that has somehow allegedly contributed to the demise of the former Soviet Union following the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan and all other major issues, including proxy wars in Africa. We need to keep in mind this lesson when we address the issue of arms race. Very expensive.